Okay, so um, today our speaker is Dr. Jason Jurgovich, who is a faculty member in the School of Geography, Development, and Environment at the U of A. The title of this talk is Navigating Differential Privacy in the De 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 Decennial, De Decennial, Decennial, correct me, Jason, uh, Census Data, What Planners and Real Estate Professionals Need to Know. Um, Jason, I'll give you a little bio about Jason in just a minute, but I'd like to um, first acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home of the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable, excuse me, uh, sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnership and community service. Our next school lecture after this is on April 1st at 12 p.m. Dr. Monica Ramirez Andriata from the Department of Environmental Science will talk about um, cultivating science justice in action through participatory research methods. That'll be a really interesting talk. Today's lecture will be approximately 45 to 50 minutes long. We will leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the lecture for questions. If you have a question, just raise your hand um, or you can write your question in the chat and I'll read it. So um, let me tell you a little about Jason. He's an associate professor of practice in School of Geography, Development and Environment. And his research focuses on social spatial implications of demographic change. He teaches courses in population geography, spatial statistics. Sorry, my thing is auto advancing, sorry about that. Um, and apply demographic methods. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today because it has very important implications for urban planning and the real estate development fields. So Jason, I'll turn it over to you. I'll stop sharing my screen and you can um, jump in. Thanks, Gina, I appreciate it. Um, can everybody see the screen? Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks to Gina, as well as Christy Carans and all of you at uh, Capla for inviting me uh, to chat with you today um, about the census. Um, this is uh, something uh, regarding the most recent census that I've been working on uh, for a number of years, actually leading up to the 2020 census. Um, and so uh, more recently, uh, with respect to the lead up of the census, uh, this topic of differential privacy has come to be a really significant issue. And so, um, uh, the, the challenge for me today is, is to try to uh, boil down a, a pretty complex topic into um, sort of the implications for, for, for planners in particular. So uh, that's the, the task at hand here. So um, so big thanks again. And I want to keep this really formal. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to just, you know, you know raise your hand, unmute yourself, let me know. Hey, can you clarify this? Um, uh, we can also address them at the end, but I'm happy to have just make this more of a, uh, a general conversation. So an overview of kind of what I want to talk about today is um, I want to start off actually with uh, just kind of situating some work that I've done around a topic related to differential privacy called uh, basically navigating statistical uncertainty in U.S. census data. Um, it, it is a really important topic, not only with respect to, um, uh, uh, I should say, with respect to planning and, and data-driven decision-making, um, and so I want to just sort of situate that, particularly talking about statistical uncertainty uh, in the American Community Survey. So I've got a couple of slides as an, as an entry point to that. Um, and then I just, I know the audience might be um, a little bit diverse in terms of understanding uh, and background regarding the decennial census. So I've got a few slides just sort of uh, underscoring the importance of the decennial census, and, and especially uh, given that we're not too far removed from the most recent census uh, two years ago, 2020. And then, of course, the topic at hand uh, is what is what is disclosure avoidance? Um, specifically, a number of elements that I think are important for us to sort of think about. Title 13, which is an important aspect um, for the census. Previous methods of disclosure avoidance. How has the Census Bureau um, used disclosure avoidance in the past? And then new methods, including the disclosure avoidance that I'm going to talk about today, uh, differential privacy and the implications for uh, data that you may be using um, from the most recent census. Uh, I conducted a paper, uh, so research paper is a white paper that was um, funded by uh, the Making Action Possible project, Making Action Possible project at, uh, at Eller. 
Um, and so I, I'm going to share with you some findings from that. And then I have some recommendations and resources in case folks want to dig a little bit further in terms of uh, looking into differential privacy. So most of you are already familiar with the American Community Survey, um, especially because planners, um, real estate folks are often viewed as the power users of ACS data. Um, so just as a reminder, sort of a refresher, the ACS is the, our nation's largest annual continuous national survey. Um, it was uh, implemented by the Census Bureau in the early 2000s. Um, and it followed the retirement of the long form. I don't know how many of you remember the long form in the 2000 census, but that was the last census at which we had the long form. And um, the ACS came along uh, a few years after that. And since then, um, we've been relying on the ACS for detailed socioeconomic housing and demographic information for communities across uh, the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, the sample really um, has, it, there's data that are, prior, that are available prior to 2005, but really for most communities, uh, the data go, uh, go all the way back to 2005. And uh, sample size, we're talking about um, roughly 1.7% of occupied housing units across the United States. That was about uh, 2 million housing units uh, in the most, uh, in 2019, in 2019 ACS. Um, one of the challenges of ACS data and the work that I've done in the past is really trying to get people to, um, you know, think about uh, the caveats associated with statistical uncertainty that's expressed through margin of error. And one of the reasons why this is challenging uh, is because although the long form data in 2000 and earlier censuses um, were drawn technically from a statistical sample, it was one in six households. Uh, that 16% sample was so large that the Census Bureau actually didn't release the margin of error for long-form data. And so when we went from long-form data to the American Community Survey, a lot of people who were working with ACS data weren't familiar with uh, statistical uh, sampling error. And so the margin of error was a new thing for a lot of folks. Uh, and so that's kind of... Uh, one of the uh, reasons why um, my previous work was focused on ACS data, particularly in terms of how planners uh, use the data. So in 2018, um, I, I published uh, an article in JAPA, uh, along with uh, colleagues at a number of uh, institutions, where we interviewed and surveyed planners across the country um, with their understanding of margin of error and uh, to what extent they engage with margin of error when they make decisions with respect to housing, transportation, um, uh, and a whole host of other areas. And so um, I've got a couple of different examples from that paper that I wanna share with you uh, in the next two slides to sort of situate this further. Um, in 2019, I released another uh, related topic, but more focused on rural communities uh, based on my work that I was doing as director of the Population Research Center in Portland at Portland State University, where we were, where we were working with rural communities across Oregon uh, that had um, estimates, uh, household income estimates that um, were above the threshold for federal funding for various programs. And so um, they, at the time, the federal programs weren't considering margin of error when they were determining whether the community was eligible for those federal funds. Uh, and so uh, this book chapter sort of talks about uh, that and makes some um, recommendations uh, with respect to uh, MOE in rural communities. So here's an example that I pulled from the JAPA piece. Uh, this is uh, child poverty data, um, 2010 through 2019 for Portland, uh, the city of Portland in purple and the Portland metropolitan area in green. Uh, and you can see, uh, obviously, here in 2010 and 2011, more than one in four children at or below the poverty level following the Great Recession, uh, child poverty was quite high. Uh, and, and in the years following that, uh, thankfully, the, um, the child poverty rate has declined. Uh, but there's three takeaways here that I think are really important with respect to navigating uncertainty that I kind of want to just focus on quickly. Uh, one is these error bars, right? So uh, you know, the error bars represent the margins of error for each of the estimates. And of course, when we're talking about that, um, 
perhaps even with a lay audience, it's kind of difficult sometimes to convey that uncertainty to policymakers. Um, the second thing is, the second takeaway is that this error bar here shows that the estimate for child poverty in 2011 is anywhere between 23 and 31 percent. So we're 90 percent sure, right, at the 90 percent confidence level, that it's somewhere between 23 and 31. So we have an eight percent degree of uncertainty, which if we're trying to make you know, uh, uh, data-driven decision-making, uh, especially when we break these data down for communities of color, so for kids of color, it becomes really difficult to sort of ensure that we have the data to make uh, equity-based decisions. Um, so in fact, the data for kids of color is so unreliable that I didn't even uh, show it here in this presentation. And then the third takeaway really is that you'll notice that the purple bars, um, the error bars for the purple lines for the city are always higher than they are for the metropolitan area. And that's just simply a function of sample size, right? The sample size, the sample for the city, because the city is a smaller population, the error is always going to be bigger for a smaller population uh, um, or a smaller geography than it is for larger geographies. Uh, if I showed you the poverty for the entire population and not just child poverty, the errors would be much smaller as well. So anytime we're working with subgroups or anytime we're working with small geographies, we're really running into this issue. So what we did is we, uh, did, we decided to come up with, um, for practice, uh, we created these profiles for every county in the state of Oregon at our office. And we knew that a lot of folks weren't well versed in statistical um, you know, related issues. So we used this green, yellow, red stoplight scenario to sort of tell people whether the statistical estimate from the ACS was reliable, moderately reliable, or unreliable. So green means obviously good, it's reliable, yellow, moderately reliable, red, do not use. Um, and we found that that was actually a really helpful way to get uh, people comfortable with thinking more carefully about margin of error. So that research really is foundational um, for the research that I've been working on with the 2020 census. So I sort of pivoted, <clears throat> excuse me, over the past really uh, two year and a half, two years, once the Census Bureau announced the uh, decisions regarding differential privacy from navigating statistical uncertainty to accounting for differential privacy. So now I'm gonna sort of talk about differential privacy uh, with respect to uh, the 2020 census. Um, I'm just curious, how many folks have at least heard of differential privacy? Um, anybody? Yeah. No, maybe, well, and, and, what, and what have you heard about it? For those that have heard about it, or what do you know? You can feel free to jump in for those of you who might know about it. Not much, mostly what I've heard from you, Jason. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, it's, it's, it's received a lot of attention actually. And if you just do a Google search for differential, differential privacy, uh, I just put a, put a couple of um, different articles here. This is from Hansi Lo Wong uh, at NPR. Uh, there is, um, it's been covered in Bloomberg. Uh, it's all over Twitter, particularly uh, among demographers and population geographers. Um, and in fact, there was a census, uh, there was a challenge uh, that Alabama had put out challenging the Census Bureau um, with respect to differential privacy that made it through, uh, through, through, the, through the courts. Um, and um, a couple months ago, it was uh, Alabama lost that, that, that challenge and, and it was, uh, the Census Bureau was allowed um, to continue to release the data uh, with differential privacy. So it's received a lot of attention uh, um, uh, in, in popular press. So uh, what I want to talk about today is a study that I could just mention to you uh, that is uh, co-authored with my uh, PhD uh, student, Nick Chun, uh, in geography. And we released this last year. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the basis of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of, uh, of the talk. 
So just as a recap, importance of the census, obviously it's the backbone of our democracy. Uh, Article one, section two of the constitution uh, mandates that the US government every 10 years conduct a census for all 50 states, Puerto Rico and the island areas of the United States. And of course, those numbers are uh, foundational to congressional representation, determining electoral votes, as well as supporting the redrawing of state and local political districts um, across the country. Of course, there's many other reasons why the census is important. Uh, voting rights and civil rights legislation depends on census data. Uh, it's the population benchmark for many federal surveys, including the ACS, the American Housing Survey, if you're working in the world of transportation, CC, CTTP package is based on census. It's really the foundation for a lot of the data that we're using uh, for data-driven decision-making. Um, and of course, when we are focusing on equity-based policy, it's also really important to ensure that um, we have the most reliable data uh, with respect to um, uh, ensuring uh, equity-based decision-making. It's also important for allocation of money, right? Each state gets from the federal government. So Arizona received $20.6 billion in federal monies that were based on census 2010 data. And that roughly works out to $3,000 per person uh, that were counted in the 2010 data. So we're talking about a lot of money that is um, that hinges on a fair and accurate count. So one of the things that is foundational with respect to census, the Census Bureau's responsibility as a steward of our data um, is Title 13. And Title 13 mandates that the, the Bureau ensure that the individual level data remain confidential. Um, and so the history on this is actually pretty interesting. I was just reading on Twitter before I jumped on the call. Um, uh, this is the 80th anniversary of uh, Japanese internment uh, during World War II. And the reason I bring that up is because the Census Bureau was involved in providing those individual level data of Japanese Americans to the War Department in the 1940s, which then caused the, uh, the federal government to identify Japanese Americans uh, that they sent off to internment camps. After that happened, in 1954, Title 13 was passed that basically prevented that from ever happening again, right? That the Census Bureau could never, um, that needed to ensure that the data remained confidential and, and ensuring that that, uh, that injustice wouldn't happen again. So Title 13 is the foundation then for disclosure avoidance. And disclosure avoidance basically means that these are the mechanisms that the Census Bureau is implementing to ensure that the data remain confidential. Now, what's interesting about disclosure avoidance is when you look back at the history of it, it's pretty fascinating. Um, in the 1930s, uh, the Census Bureau started not releasing small area data to protect individual confidentiality. But really, disclosure avoidance became much more common after Title 13 was passed in 54. So in 1970, there were whole tables that were suppressed. Uh, to protect individual individual confidentiality. In, 19, in the 1990s, they implemented this, um, this thing called data swapping, uh, which basically meant moving data from one area to another to protect individual confidentiality. And then in the 2000s and following the 2010 census, um, there was imputation uh, to protect uh, individual confidentiality, as well as table and cell suppression. Again, I'm kind of going through these pretty quickly, but the point is, is that there are just a number of mechanisms that the bureaus use to be able to protect our, our data. Um, what you need to know about that though, is that, that all of these mechanisms, uh, the parameters for how they actually do this have been unpublished, right? We don't really know how those actually affect the data quality. And that's been actually a major hindrance for data users in terms of knowing what the Bureau is doing with respect to protecting individual confidentiality. The problem at hand is this, that those traditional methods of data disclosure are no longer effective in the current data environment. Um, because of the availability of big data and public data in particular, and the, and the ability to identify people throughout data sets, Census Bureau researchers were able to re-identify the race, age, sex, all the way and the location, all the way down to the census block of 219 million individuals from the most recent census. And once the Bureau did this, they set them on a trajectory of, holy cow, 
we need to implement a new method of disclosure avoidance to ensure that the data remain confidential. And that is what's led to differential privacy. So what the census decided to do was in the 2020 census, they were gonna protect individual privacy in two ways. They were gonna implement differential privacy and they were going to release uh, less detailed data. And those two things together, they argued would be really important for protecting individual confidentiality. So data privacy at its core, I'm sorry, differential privacy at its core involves injecting noise or error into the publicly available data in order to make it more difficult to potentially re-identify respondents. And so what is different about differential privacy from other methods of disclosure avoidance is that the amount of noise that's injected into the, into the data is now quantifiable. We know the level of noise and census bureaus made that public. Of course, the cost is that we have less accurate data, right? So there's this balancing that the Census Bureau must do between privacy on one end of the spectrum and accuracy on the other end of the spectrum. So what does it look like um, in terms of uh, in terms of on the ground? Uh, uh, let me go back actually before. I just want to say one example that I, I use in the in the report and that I use in class with my students um, is that it's kind of akin to Sudoku, right? Where you have a puzzle and you kind of have some data points throughout the puzzle. And um, users solve that unknown, those unknowns based on the available information of what's known. And the Census Bureau is kind of doing a Sudoku-based uh, system with our individual level data, right? Uh, 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 sex identity, race identity, age, relationship status. If you know five or six of those variables for an individual, particularly in a small area of geography, a census block, it's relatively easy to identify who that person might be. So what is the effects of differential privacy? Um, in, the initial, um, uh, in the initial round of, of, data, of the data release, uh, it looked like this. I picked, um, I know this is kind of hard to see, I use Social Explorer here. I picked this census tract right here. Uh, this is the uh, Santa Cruz Park area. This is I-10 right here. Um, and so I'm looking at um, this tract right here, just west of I-10 along the Santa Cruz River. And so what the, what the effects of differential privacy are for this particular tract in the initial round of data look like this. Um, the, uh, the Black African-American uh, population in this census tract in 2010 was 243. And with the initial round of differential privacy, it would have been 381, which meant that if you were computing the population change between 2000 and 2010, the actual, uh, there was an actual decline in the black or African-American population of 39 individuals, but with differential privacy, the number would have been 99. So that's a pretty big effect, right? In a way that would materially change potentially our decision-making with respect to service delivery um, or looking at policy related outcomes in this census tract. So the, the challenge then is this, differential privacy yields less accurate data for small area geographies, as well as for communities of color, because these subpopulations require more, more noise to protect their individual level privacy. And it's kind of akin to margin of error, which is why I started with that in the beginning, uh, because margin of error biases small area geographies and subpopulations in a similar way, albeit quite fundamentally different. Um, and so that has been one of the major concerns for um, Nick and, and me, as well as many other scholars across the country, uh, in that this effect of differential privacy has, uh, has um, inordinate effects for small area, uh, small area geographies, especially for people of color. So our interest then was, okay, let's take a look at the noise and let's look at the effects uh, particularly among communities of color. And we want to really understand this not only from an academic exercise, but also with respect to public policy and how this would affect our decision making. So there were two questions that we asked in the white paper that was released last year. How reliable are differential, differentially private data for Arizonans of color? 
And to what extent does differential privacy introduce unequal data, data distortion among Arizonans of color for sub-county geographies? Uh, our study area was the four counties in Southern Arizona, Cochise, Pima, um, Santa Cruz, and Yuma. And we did our analysis at the tract level, at the census tract level. So the data that we use for this um, are demonstration data that were released by the Census Bureau. And the Bureau did this for this, for this purpose. It allowed researchers to assess the potential effects of differential privacy across various geographies. And um, what they did is they released 2010 data uh, that were the actual data, which we already had, and then the data with differential privacy, so we could see the effects of differential privacy. And that's those are the data that I just gave you for that Santa Cruz tract uh, for the Black population. So what you need to know is that there were multiple files that were released by the Census Bureau, uh, and I'll give you, I'll show you what those look like in a second. But there wasn't just one demonstration file; there was like six, <laughs> and. And they were based on this thing called the privacy loss budget, which is an epsilon. And it's basically a number that is somewhere on the continuum where you have perfect privacy and the data are completely useless. They're not accurate. And then over on the right, the data are perfect and completely accurate, but you have no privacy. And so the Bureau over the time, over the past two years prior to the, prior to the release of the 2020 data, we're giving us these demonstration files with different privacy loss budgets. And that affected the uh, reliability of the data in terms of accuracy. So the PLB or the privacy loss budget is the maximum amount of privacy loss that were allowed in the 2020 data. If the PLB, if the epsilon is higher, it means there's more accurate data and there's less privacy. Um, so the demonstration files look like this. These were the different periods. The first one they released was in November 2019. You can see that the epsilon is relatively low at four. It was four all the way through the, the um, prior to the release of the data, actually, in April. You remember the 2020 data released in the summer of 21. So what's interesting is we're all assuming it's going to be four. And our analysis is based on four. And then they come along and they release two files. One that is at four and one that's at 10.3, which really, as you might imagine, upset a lot of researchers because it just was so different than what we had looked at before. And then the final value was actually much higher than that. So the 2020 data are actually based on an epsilon of 17.14, which is remarkable. And I hope that maybe some of our research ended up causing them to uh, increase that so we had more accurate data. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for sure, but um, our analysis uses the 2019 file. And of course, because that's not so applicable today, uh, because the actual was 17, I actually have data for you on what the, what the uh, epsilon was, uh, for the final uh, production uh, take was, just so you have a sense of that. And there's good news there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time here, although it is important for planners to think about this. Um, the privacy loss budget varies by geography. And so what you need to know is if you're working at different geographies, the amount of noise that you'll encounter with respect to differential privacy varies. So I want to highlight a couple um, things here. You'll notice that the block uh, level geography, the all the way through, the privacy loss budget was generally pretty high for the block. And then at the end, they just dropped it off precipitously, which means block level data, especially relative to other census geographies, have more noise in them than, more, than bigger geographies. So if you're working at the block level, you really need to be mindful of how differential privacy is affecting your data. The good note, oh, sorry. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going on that. We can come back to that uh, if people have questions, but I wanna share with you uh, the findings because I'm running a little bit long here. So how reliable are differentially private data for Arizona's color? Um, what we found, and again, this is based on the November data and I've got the final production value, which should assuage some angst regarding these. 
Uh, the November data were really problematic. The differential privacy error was severe for non-Hispanic populations of color, and it was negligible for non-Hispanic white and Hispanic Latino populations. So here's what it looked like. Uh, these are our median values for all census tracts in Southern Arizona, right? So this was across the four counties. And so what you saw is that, um, you know, the Native American population, the median value was 30 plus or minus eight, which meant the relative error was 26% uh, in terms of the value across all tracts. Uh, Asian population, 62 plus or minus 10. Um, so these are quite severe. And of course, in many tracks, they were really high. In some tracks, they were relatively low. Uh, but this was kind of the overarching takeaway based on our analysis. Again, because the privacy loss budget was increased so significantly, look what happened with the, the final values. They're much lower, which is good. We have more accurate data. But um, so we feel better about that. And we think that's a good thing. And um, we're hopeful that you know, some of the feedback that the Bureau received caused them to sort of pivot on this. Uh, my caveat here though, is that this is the census tract, right? So if you go down to the block group or you go down to the block, you're gonna encounter a higher degree of error. Um, then uh, how reliable are differentially private data for Arizonans of color? Um, we said in our, in our report that the error renders data for non-Hispanic population of color unreliable across many census tracts. I actually have a map, which is probably no longer really applicable. It's an interactive um, uh, ArcGIS map, which allows you to actually mouse over every track to see the level of reliability. We created an error index. Of course, with the new privacy loss budget, that uh, would need to be updated, and I haven't had a chance to do that. But our concern and our message to the Bureau with this November 19 data was that we had serious concerns about realizing data-driven and equity-focused governance based on that privacy loss budget. Um, and then this, these are the data uh, at the, at the uh, county level. Um, so what we did is these are all the tracks in Pima County. These are all the tracks in Cochise County, all the tracks in Santa Cruz. And the point here is that the um, the noise varies by racial ethnic group across geography, right? So if I can just show you an example here, in Pima County across um, uh, census tracts, Black or African American population, the error was 13%, but in, um, I can't see this, Cochise, it's, uh, it was 27%, and it was even higher in Santa Cruz simply because the Black population is smaller in that County in Santa Cruz than it is in Cochise and Pima. So where you run into small populations, you're going to end up having a higher degree of error that you have to uh, have to work through. And again, the good news is that these errors have fallen precipitously with the final values. Um, again, they're not zero, right? They're not, and you could argue these are negligible, but I think given the size of error, relative error, three, four, five, six, seven percent this at least requires a footnote in our work, right? And in disclosure to our uh, um, partners in terms of the fact that, that this ex these errors exist uh, in the data. Uh, the second question, to what extent does differential privacy introduce unequal data distortion among Arizonans of color at sub-county geographies? Uh, we found that population size and race ethnicity, which I just mentioned to you before, not whether it's an urban rural location, uh, are significant, statistically significant factors of differential privacy error. Uh, in the November uh, uh, demonstration file, more than half of all census tracts in the four counties in Southern Arizona had at least one racial ethnic group with severe data distortion. So I'm gonna go back to the example that I gave you for the black population in the Santa Cruz uh, census tract. Um, this was the November data that I showed you, but look what it actually ended up being. Um, so the differential privacy under the final production value was just one. Um, so that gives you a sense of what that increase in the privacy loss budget from four to 17 drastically improved the accuracy of the data um, uh, at the track level. Again, at the track level, this would be different at the block group or block level. So what are the takeaways? Because um, I know there's a lot there. 
Um, the takeaways are this. The final production values make 2020 census data significantly more accurate due to the increased privacy loss budget. Many of the findings that we found disconcerting in our report um, are less of an issue, but they're not eliminated. Um, and in fact, we're still trying to get our arms around this for implications for policy. Um, there's a number of important caveats though. So many of the trends are place specific. So just like I showed you in the values for the entire region are different than the values by each county. So if you're working across the United States, you're going to run into, you know, an issue in Arizona it may not be a low error, but it may be a higher error if you're working in Idaho. Um, what are the recommendations? Um, my recommendations are this. Researchers and planners still need to critically examine the demographic profiles of their study areas to assess the impacts of differential privacy. And this kind of adds an additional responsibility uh, as we work through census data. But unfortunately, this is uh, the, one of the challenges that we have to face as we think about this. Um, block level data contain considerable noise, so aggregate whenever possible. Uh, I think that's really an important lesson actually from this. And I'm I'm actually working on a study right now for a peer review piece that is actually doing this to try to show um, what best practices are uh, and look like uh, for, say, for example, if you're looking at a neighborhood in a city and you're trying to get a sense of aggregating tracks versus aggregating blocks, how does the error vary between uh, those two census geographies? There are a number of fitness for use statistics from the Census Bureau, which allow you to get a sense of how much error is in the data. Um, and I have some uh, websites that I, uh, pages that you can check uh, out for those. If you had, if you have feedback and insight, there is a group at the Census Bureau, um, as well as the ACS Data Users Group, where the Bureau is still uh, soliciting feedback with respect to differential privacy. And of course, I would just st say, stay tuned to the research on this because it is ever evolving. Um, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Beth Jarosh, wrote a PDF report on disclosure avoidance in the 2020 census. Um, it's really well done, and I think it gives you a really good uh, sense of kind of what I've talked about today. Um, it's actually available on this website, and I can make these slides available if folks want. Um, you can click on this link, and it'll take you uh, to the Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance page where you can read more about uh, differential privacy. Um, one of the things, and if you can just, I think this is really important, is there's actually a crosswalk that the bureaus made available between 2010 data and 2020 data in terms of whether the data are available uh, between the two censuses. And I just want to share that with you, uh, if you don't mind. Um, it's really uh, overwhelming at first. <laughs> But look at the, um, down the bottom, there's a PL crosswalk, and I'll zoom in here so you can see this. If you're working with any of these table numbers, which are uh, race, Hispanic, Latino by race, uh, it shows you that the 2020 data, you're able to get those at the block level, just like you were in 2010. No changes there, which means if you're doing longitudinal analysis, that's really good news. I don't have such great news for other tables. Uh, in fact, if you go down to here, the DP crosswalk, this is, these are demographic profiles. And if I zoom in a little bit, you'll notice that sex by age, median age by sex. Previously, those were all available at the track level in 2010. The smallest geography you can now get those for is at the place or minor civil division level, which is a big change in terms of data availability. And this goes on and on and on. All these, uh, the, D, the DHC tables, um, I, I just, this is a really helpful spreadsheet. So <laughs> if you're doing any work across uh, censuses, this is probably something you want to check out. Um, I've got one more slide. Uh, there's another, there's a number of webinars that the Census Bureau has released on this. And if you really want to dig into this and more information, uh, this is a separate page off the Census Bureau's website. Uh, where you can go back and check out the webinars where they explain the rationale for differential privacy and related implications. So um, I think I wrapped it up just about in time. We got some time for questions. I know there's some in the chat. So thank you so much. Uh, I hope that was helpful in terms of framing things and uh, look forward if you have questions you, you, that you didn't get a chance to uh, um, you know, chat with you today. I'm happy to chat, uh, chat about this. So thank you. Thank you, Jason.
Um, I'll go ahead and read the question that's in the chat. Um, Kelly asks, can you address the amount of noise when the geography is a Native American on a reservation, not a census tract? And the follow-up question from H. Trossel is, I second this question, I'm a tribal broadband researcher and I'm constantly working reservation geographies. Yeah, so let me go back and actually bring up um, if you're the the uh, the amount of noise by geography slide. Uh, where is that? So what you'll notice on this slide is that they don't have a list for uh, tri tribal area. Um, oh gosh, tribal area geographies. Uh, these are standards. The standard sort of census geographies. Um, and and I I'd have to check in the um, where this pay, where these data come from to see if they release uh, the privacy loss budget for tribal specific areas. I don't know that number off uh, the top of my head. I will say, um, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but related to the tribal question, um, I don't know how many of you have been paying attention to some of the data coming out in terms of the analyses on the 2020 undercount. Um, but the early results, PES, by the way, the data, the undercount data are coming out next month. So we'll know what the undercount was in the census by the racial ethnic group. But if you remember from 2010, which is one of our more accurate censuses in modern American history, we had essentially a zero net undercount overcount in terms of total population. We still had sizable undercounts across racial and ethnic groups, right? 2% of African-Americans were excluded in the census. That's roughly 800,000 individuals that were missed in the 2010 census. 1.5% of Hispanic Latino individuals, that's set roughly 750,000 Hispanic Latino individuals. The early analysis uh, looks like it's going to have increased for 2020 uh, among those racial and ethnic groups. And the highest relative count of the undercount is Native Americans living on reservations. Almost 5% of Native Americans living on reservations were undercounted in 2010. And if you followed the way in which the Bureau was doing their work with the shutdown of COVID in 2020, there's concern that that will also increase beyond 5%. So that's a, an additional error on top of this error, right? So um, that if you're working on tribal geographies and, and reservations and tribal lands, that's uh, absolutely imperative to keep your beat on this error as well as the undercount error. Thanks for uh, bringing it up, Jason. That was going to be my question about the 2020 census and the uh, the you know um, abbreviated collection period. You know, it, it coupled with um, you know politicizing the census. Um, that's kind of scary to know. Um, the error rates can increase substantially. Um, I think I have a, we have another question from Arlie. Great, thanks, Jason. Good presentation. Um, I, very interesting. I think good reminder for all of us to uh, be very careful with the data we're using. Question is, do you think we're headed in a direction where planners, researchers um, need to be thinking about um, supplementary data? Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's so much data out there um, that you know, private sector knows everything about all of us. Um, and just sort of, yeah, I guess, are, are we headed in a direction where ACS is, is, you know, 10 years from now when when even more precautions are put in place, is it just going to be less and less usable for our purposes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question early. And I, I think, um, you know, one of the, there's a couple of things I thought was thinking of as you were asking the question. Um, one of the things that happened regarding the ECS that caused a lot of people to panic last year was the Census Bureau announced that they were moving to, quote, fully synthetic data by 2024 in the ACS. And that caused the research community to lose <laughs> itself. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of things that are happening in and at the Census Bureau not only regarding the more recent stuff, but also even just the margin of error. I remember when we were working in Portland and going back to the example I was just giving you with the, the child poverty by race, um, the Portland um, uh, uh, school district had come to us and really wanted to have some more granular data for child poverty by race. And, and so they wanted to make you know, um, programming decisions for their son's schools, which was uh, focused on uh, ensuring you know, uh, 
uh, equity across uh, for kids of color. And we looked at the data, we just said, listen, like these data are not reliable at all. It was like, you know, child estimates of poverty for the Asian community, Asian kids in a census tract was like 20% plus or minus 20%, right? So it could be zero to 40. <laughs> like, what do you do with that, right? So we ended up, they ended up um, deciding to use um, uh, data that they had internally on free and reduced lunch. Um, and we're able to sort of make the decisions they need, needed to make using that internal data over the unreliability of data uh, from, from the ACS. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we're, we're going to need to be a little bit more creative and think more strategically be a, a more than uh, just defaulting to census data. And it really pains me to say that because I'm an ardent defender of the Census Bureau. I respect the work that they do. And there's a lot of great folks that work at the Bureau, but there's a lot of challenges right now with respect to just working within the current data environment. And I also think, this is my personal opinion, we need to think about what does modernizing Title 13 look like in 2022? You know, like the, the Title 13 is based on a 1954 definition of what was available in terms of data. And like you said, most, there's most, most, private firms, especially from the social media world, know more about us than like, and there's been a lot of pushback on that. So, but the Census Bureau has to follow with the current federal law, right? So right now the current federal law is Title 13. And unless we have a revisit of that, um, we're, we will, they will continue to sort of walk down this track and we're going to need to sort of think about as scholars and, and researchers, how we end up navigating that. Thanks, Jason. Um, I think we have um, at least one more question and we'll have time for a second if anybody has one. But Nate asks, with confidentiality protections in place, how much more, if at all, will charrettes be utilized and can they accomplish the same goals that were previously done from census data? Yeah, I think, it. I mean, good question, Nate. I think the answer to that depends on you know, the type of data that are being used in the charrette, whether it's decennial data, ECS data, the level of granularity, the geographic specificity, whether you're looking at subgroups, racial and ethnic subgroups, subgroups by age, uh, or just even data broke. Like we, we don't, I don't know, for example, um, um, like I've got some research on uh, same sex demographic statistics. And I'm particularly interested this time, this is the first census that we have same-sex demographic statistics on those that are married, right? And they haven't been released yet. And so, like, what if, if if this is the level of noise for age and race? What does the level of noise look like for us uh, for same-sex married couples, which are a really small slice of the population? And so, to answer your question about charrettes, I, we don't we only have this much of the entire story, right? Um, and, the, and we'll just have to see how this shakes out as the rest of the data get released. Do, Thank we, you. do we have any other questions? Raise your hand. I think, think Bo uh, has a question. Bo, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. This is really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Also, you talk about the practical application for planners. That's really uh, appreciated. Uh, so my question is, um, um, what would be the takeaway or your suggestion? Uh, for example, last year we have talked about this uh, congressional and the legislative districts redraw the maps of those districts, and that heavily depends on the population you have, right? On top of what uh, um, Kelly was asking about native uh, nations. So I wonder about what was your suggestion for that type of very practical mapping based on population and other things? Thank you. Great question. Um, I was involved in discussions with a number of different groups that were working on the Arizona redistricting in the fall. Um, and I'll just tell you the, sh the short story of the long story is that although I tried to bring this up as an issue when it went to the independent commission, uh, it generally wasn't, uh, it, was, it, was, it was felt that it was too technical. Um, to really focus on this aspect with respect to thinking about drawing, redrawing legislative lines. Um, and I think for, that's not unique to Arizona. I think that was kind of how it played out in many other states. This is kind of, um, it's kind of inside census baseball, to be honest. Um, and it hasn't, it's kind of been a discussion that's kind of been for folks that are really close to how census 
releases data and in it it really and this is actually one of the things that I write about in the um, uh, in our report in the conclusion is although the Census Bureau made a good valiant effort to reach out to the general public and data users to get their feedback I think I think the Census Bureau would even agree to that that we didn't do as good of a job, the Bureau didn't do as good of a job in terms of reaching out to average data users to really inform them of the implications of this. And to be fair, this was the middle of a pandemic. It was in the middle of an election year. There was a lot of stuff going on. And you know, this would have been another issue for people to try to get their arms around. And it's not easy, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. There's a lot of pieces here, it's very technical. And um, so what I, my, what I find interesting is when I log on to Twitter, you know, every other day or whatever, I see more and more people finding out about it and being outraged. And in fact, there was, um, the Bureau had announced last month there was gonna be restrictions on CPS data. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with CPS data, but current population survey, and there was some restrictions on what was gonna be available in terms of they were gonna erase availability for data that was used for economic forecasting. And the economist, <laughs> they they just went crazy. They're like, what? This is no longer available. This is, you know, so it doesn't, I don't think it's going to stop here. I think it's going to, it's going to make its way through other Census Bureau um, applications um, and programs and surveys. And so um, I know I'm kind of meandering from your original question, but uh, um, it, to be the short is that it wasn't, I don't think, fully uh, teased out in the redistricting process. Thank you, thank Jason. You, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, I think we'll we'll wrap up here, but um, if anybody has any specific questions for Jason, um, he's available by email, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to work on a project with Jason. I'm sure he's available to collaborate with you. Um, so uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. I think it was a very informative uh, presentation for our, for our college. Great. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Good to see you yeah. all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.